Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Yokogawa's web seminar titled Motors and Drives Analysis. I would like to thank you all for taking the time to attend this seminar, and I hope you find it both helpful and informative. Before we begin, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping issues. The audio part of this seminar can be accessed either through the teleconference number provided in the info tab of your WebEx manager window or through your PC speakers. To hear the audio through your PC, select the Communicate tab and join the audio broadcast. This seminar will last approximately one hour. Towards the end of the presentation, we will have a Q&A section where, time permitting, our featured speaker, Bill Gatheridge, will answer some of the questions received from the audience. If your question is not answered during the presentation, please be assured that we will answer them all via email directly after the webinar. All questions should be submitted in the Q&A windows or the chat window located in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Our featured presenter for this event is Bill Gatheridge, Product Manager with Yokogawa. Bill is responsible for the Power Analyzer product line, as well as other measuring instruments. He has over 25 years experience with Yokogawa in the area of precision electrical power measurements, and has been teaching various power measurement topics and applications for the past 15 years. He is a member and vice chairman of the ASME PTC 19.6 Committee on Electrical Power Measurements for Utility Power Plant Performance Testing. He is also a member of the RTCA DO160 Committee for Aircraft Power Testing and has worked with an ASHRAE Committee on Variable Speed Drive Testing. Bill holds a degree in Electrical Engineering from Purdue University. Without further ado, I will now hand it over to Bill. Thank you, Christina, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. And as Christina said, topic for today is the uh, testing of uh, motors and variable speed drives. And part of our uh, commitment to our customers, to you guys, is not only providing measurement uh, uh, solutions, but also education uh, for electrical power measurements. And so. That's what we're going to do today is hopefully answer your questions on motor and drive testing. So if you do have uh, questions, as uh, Christina said, uh, you can direct those uh, either in the chat window or to a website that we have uh, set up for when webinar Wednesdays at us.yokogawa.com. And we will try to answer those for you. A little bit about Yokogawa corporate history, if you've not been with us uh, before, uh, the company was founded in 1915. So this year is our 100th anniversary that we're celebrating. And so we've come a long way from some of the original uh, moving coil type instruments like this. Uh, we think it's about a 1930s vintage uh, standard AC voltmeter to the uh, high technology precision uh, power analyzers that we have uh, today. So North American sales were established in the state of New York back in 1957, and we moved to Georgia in the mid-80s, where we're at now. Worldwide sales right now are in excess of $4.3 billion, so we do have a large corporation behind us. Yokogawa operates 84 companies like Yokogawa Corporation of America worldwide with over 20,000 employees in 33 countries. This is our facility where we're uh, coming uh, today in Noonan, Georgia. Where's Noonan, Georgia? Well, we know where Atlanta's at. We're just uh, down Interstate 85, a little bit from uh, uh, Atlanta. So we're close enough. We can go to Atlanta when we want to, but we don't have to go there all the time. So today's topic, of course, is electric motor and variable speed drive testing. Our objective is to give you a three-step process for a complete electrical test of an AC motor and then combine it with a variable speed drive for a complete system. So we'll look at the motor testing by itself and then the complete drive and motor testing. What we're going to do today, we're going to start with some basic power measurements. So we want to review a few things just to make sure if you haven't been with us uh, on some of the electrical power measurements, especially as related to uh, the motors and drives. We're going to talk about mechanical power measurements. 
some things to consider on your instrument selection and current sensors, which are very important in this type of test. Then we'll look at a three-phase uh, AC motor, uh, the power measurements on a three-phase AC motor, and uh, just study some things on three-phase measurements in general. We'll look at the mechanical power measurements, speed and torque sensors, uh, motor efficiency measurements. Then we'll get into a PWM, pulse width modulated uh, drive system. Look at the input and output electrical measurements on this drive. Uh, we'll look at uh, you know the, the drive, the power loss and efficiency measurements, and some of the other typical measurements that we need to make on these systems. Then we'll put it all together, put the motor and the drive system together, and make measurements of the complete system, showing you how to do the efficiency. We'll look at a little bit of some of the industry standards, especially like IEEE Standard 112, uh, which really deals with a lot of the motor testing uh, procedures. Hopefully we'll answer your questions as we uh, go through the uh, webinar. So let's start with uh, part one, our basic uh, electrical power measurement review. I like to start with good old Ohm's law because that's the basis of all of our measurements. So Ohm's law, we're talking about power today in the simplest form, DC, it's our volts times our amps. Uh, we can look at a couple other things, but just remember we're talking about uh, power and uh, volts times amps is our basic uh, formula. Some relationships that uh, I need you to be aware of as we're making our measurements, uh, the relationship between um, you know, average uh, or mean, half cycle average, uh, true RMS, peak-to-peak uh, -peak values, and these have to do with a sine wave. So if we know the RMS value, right, and we want to look at the peak, well, we know that's the square root of 2, 1.414. But this right here is something that we use quite a bit on PWM is the uh, what we call average or half cycle average or mean value. And so if we uh, make a, a mean value measurement and we want to get the RMS, it's a multiplier of 1.11. And we do use this quite a bit on the uh, variable speed drives. So if we look at a couple of relationships here, if I got a 120 volt uh, RMS, Okay, we set that as the uh, top cursor, 120 volts, and our mean scale to RMS, okay, this has the 1.11 multiplier on it, so we take the half cycle average, multiply it by 1.11, and we'll get the basically 120. Now our average, or that half cycle average, or mean, was actually calculated as 108. So if you take this 108 times 1.11, uh, you should come out to 120. And in this case, we had a peak value of uh, about 170 volts. So the cursors on here uh, show the RMS value and the mean value. So measurement of power. First question, what's a watt? Well, it's a unit of power equal to one joule of energy per second. And you might say, well, oh, I thought this was going to be easy. What's a joule? An energy. Uh, come on, Bill. <laughs> Make it simple, okay? Uh, if we look at a DC source, simplest form from Ohm's law, we know our watts is equal to the volts times the amps. Now, with an AC source, it's the wattage, the power, is equal to volts times amps times power factor. And you'll notice I say power factor, not cosine of theta. Uh, cosine of theta is okay if you're working with a pure sine wave but we're not going to be working with a pure sine wave in all cases today, especially when we're looking at uh, drives, so that's where we say power factor. So with our AC power measurement, several terms that may come about, one of them is uh, active power. This is watts, or the RMS voltage times the RMS current times the power factor. Sometimes you may hear the terms as a true power or real power, all the same. I want an active power or true power measurement. Uh, these are all the same. Then our apparent power is just the volts amps, volts times amps. Okay, that's the apparent power part. And we use a symbol S, like SAM, for apparent power. These are international symbols that uh, we're all using now. 
So how do we measure power? In the power uh, analyzers that we're using, they're uh, using a digitizing technique uh, to convert the analog signals to digital form. So we're digitizing each of the uh, inputs, the voltage and the current, and then we use digital signal processing techniques to determine these actual values of uh, RMS voltage, current, uh, real power. And so through that in our uh, DSPs is where we get the, the data from the digitized value. Now, a lot of scopes have a power analysis function, and they're going to use a special firmware to make these true power measurements. But when we digitize a signal, you've got to remember it's uh, what I say somewhat restricted because it is sampled data. So we're taking samples, and it is uh, a digitized or sampled uh, measurement technique. A lot of our power analyzers and uh, power scopes use an FFT algorithm uh, so we can do harmonic analysis and some of the other uh, power analysis functions. So again, looking at how do we do this mathematically, we digitize the incoming voltage and we digitize the incoming current. Take these instantaneous values and we accumulate those over some time period, integrate it and multiply by one over T. So it's an instantaneous voltage times an instantaneous current then integrated over some time period. This time period can be fixed, it could be a variable, um, depending on the type of instrument that we're using. All right, here's a waveform. The yellow is a voltage waveform. The, the green kind of chopped a little bit noisy would be the current. We look at an RMS voltage of 118.67, and I got a RMS current of 0.6376. If we multiply those together, that would give us the VA, the S, okay, 75.67 VA. And then here's my power factor, lambda. That's the international symbol now for power factor. Okay, so this is determined as 0.9657. And that's calculated. We know our VA. Here's our watt measurement, okay, 73.07. And so the uh, power factor is measured, true power factor, as the uh, watts divided by the VA, and that's where we get to 0.9657. A couple other things we're showing the uh, frequency uh, of the uh, voltage. In this case, we're looking at the uh, THD of the current, total harmonic distortion. We're looking at the uh, uh, VARs. Okay, so in this case, it was uh, shows negative. And that's by convention, it's a capacitive input on this example that we were doing. So remember, true RMS measurements. We digitize the incoming voltage times the incoming current, take those instantaneous samples, accumulate them over some time period, integrate over this time period, multiply by one over T. That's the total true power. Just like your RMS root mean square, okay? So again, this is just the uh, integral of the voltage, and we take the, uh, the, the square root of that, in the same way with the current. So these calculations are going to give you a true power measurement. They're going to give you a true RMS measurement on any type of a waveform, any type of distortion. It will include all the harmonic content up to the bandwidth of the instrument. So this technique is going to give you a true power and true RMS measurement. So total power then is just calculated as the DC component plus the first order harmonic times its phase shift cosine of theta, the second order times its cosine of theta, or more precisely, it's just the summation of all the harmonic orders, both times current times the cosine of theta, each of the harmonic orders plus the DC value if it's present. So that's the, the total power then includes all the harmonic content. So how do we measure power? Uh, Blondell's transformation, Blondell's theory. If you ever heard of Blondell, maybe someplace along the line, he established all this vector analysis uh, and it states that total power is measured with one less wattmeter 
than the number of wires. So most of our testing is on our motors probably going to be in a three-phase three-wire. To measure total power, we only need two watt meters. Single phase, two wire, simple motor, we just need one watt meter, one voltage, one current. And like some of our uh, uh, split phase at uh, home, uh, single phase, three wire, uh, we should use a two watt meter method on that. Just like the three wire, three phase, use two watt meters. Then our three phase, four wire, of course, we're going to use the three watt meters. We're going to measure all three phases of voltage and current. So we got a load. This could be our motor, some type of a three phase, three wire load. Bondell says I need two watt meter method. So we're going to monitor uh, with one and two watt meters. We're going to measure the phase current and the line to line voltage. And we don't need this third one. All we need is the two watt meters. Total power is going to be the sum of the watt meter A plus the watt meter B. So what are the advantages of the two watt meter method? Well, it's a simple installation and in wiring, uh, very good at, in uh, production testing. Uh, you only need to use uh, maybe two of the current transformers, and if you had high voltage, uh, two of the potential transformers. It will give you an accurate power measurement on a balanced or an unbalanced system. So it's a simple method, especially for production testing after your design is done. Then we have another method. I say this is the best method for you guys that are in the engineering and R&D work, where we can measure all three phases. We'll put a watt meter in all three. Okay, we're going to measure the voltage and the current in each of the phase, and we're going to measure the voltage from each line to line measurement. So this could be our three phase, three wire load. This could be your motor out here. This way we can see what's going on with each of the phases. So on power factor measurement, how do we do that? We thought from school, power factor was cosine of theta. Uh, that's okay for a sine wave. And this is what we call displacement power factor. Okay, time displacement between the voltage and the current. But we don't always have a sine wave. So for all other waveforms, the power factor is going to be defined as true power factor as the watts divided by the VA. So any type of waveform, uh, however distorted it may be, uh, this is the way we get the true power factor. So on a three-phase, four-wire system, our power factor is going to be the uh, total watts divided by the total VA. So the total watts is going to be the sum of the one, two, three watt meters, right? And the total VA is going to be the sum of the three VAs each of the three phase uh, currents times its phase voltage. But now if we go back to the two watt meter method, <clears throat> power factor is the total watts divided by the total VA. So the two watt meter method is just watt meter one plus watt meter two. And the VA is the um, uh, VA one plus VA two uh, times square root of three divided by two, square root of three because it's a line to line voltage measurement and divide by two uh, to get the average of, of the two VA readings. Now, if this load is unbalanced, say we got some phase current differences, we could see some error in this calculation because we're assuming uh, this balanced and dividing by two to get the average. So our power factor and our VA measurements could be off if we have a, you know, a large unbalance. So this is where we like to use what uh, we call in our power meters a 3V3A, three voltage, three current wiring method. So power is still the two watt meter method. It's a three wire system. So watt one plus watt two to get our total power. Now we take all three of the VAs. And so if we have an unbalance in current or something like that, we're going to measure them all, add them together. We're going to uh, square root of three and then divide by three to get the average of all three of these. This is the uh, uh, best method for measuring 
your three-phase, three-wire system, because if it is balanced or unbalanced, especially if it's unbalanced, okay, we're taking all three of these VAs into consideration to make the proper calculation. So, again, in our power analyzers, we have this uh, three-phase, three-wire, 3V, three 3A three wiring system uh, that's uh, best for balanced or unbalanced three-wire system. Okay, we've done a quick review of some of the electrical measurements. Uh, now let's look at some of the mechanical power measurements. In the electric motor, piece of bin, mechanical power. Very simple, speed times torque. And we know our mechanical power is typically defined as either kilowatts or horsepower. And conversion, you know, one watt is going to equal one joule per second, or the joule is a newton meter per second. So the joule is a newton meter, and then our time. So we can calculate our mechanical power. Uh, we got a, a tachometer uh, and a torque meter on it. So two times pi times the rotating speed in RPM times the torque. So your torque meter's got to be in the units of Newton meter. We divide by 60. Okay. And then this will give us the mechanical power in watts. So horsepower is some unit of work done per unit of time. Uh, we've, if you remember, our horsepower is about 33,000 pound-feet of work per minute. Some other conversions, uh, horsepower, can, we can take the RPM times the torque in pound-feet, if you measure the torque, and divide it by the constant of 5252. 5,252, so that can give us the horsepower. We also know that um, horsepower, some conversions, a lot of times you may see it rounded off to 746 watts per horsepower, uh, a little more precise, 745.7, or very precise uh, out to uh, five decimal places. So we can convert our watts to horsepower. Okay, on an AC induction motor, uh, some of the other measurements that we can uh, look at is the uh, motor speed. And this is the actual speed at which the shaft rotates. And this is where we typically use a, a tachometer, okay, on, on, on the motor shaft. Could be a, a light pickup, could be a mechanical tachometer, but uh, we pick up the actual motor speed off the shaft, rotating shaft. Then we have what we call synchronous speed. That's the speed of the uh, stator's magnetic field rotation. And it's the motor's theoretical speed, uh, since the uh, rotor is always going to turn slightly slower. So our synchronous speed can be calculated as 120 times our frequency, line frequency, divided by the number of poles in the motor. So you have to know a little bit about the motor uh, configuration and how it was built. Another term uh, measurement that we do is what we call the slip. All right, this is the difference in the speed of the rotor, and I just called that rotor speed, and the synchronous speed, uh, which I just called SS. So our synchronous speed minus our uh, rotor speed divided by the synchronous speed will give us a percent of slip. And again, that's just the difference, okay, between the rotor speed and the synchronous speed. So we know mechanical power efficiency, very simple terms, is the output power divided by the input power. Or in this case, it's the uh, mechanical power divided by the electrical input power. Okay, let's look at some instrumentation to make these measurements. Uh, some of the North American motor testing standards that uh, we deal with, uh, you may deal with, 
uh, may come up. Uh, the IEEE 112 is uh, probably one of the most common one. Uh, NAVLAP, uh, you know, 150 is uh, similar. And then Canada has their CSA uh, C390. And so these are the accuracy requirements for motor testing. This is motor testing, not the drives, but just the motor itself. So it says you have to measure the input power uh, with an accuracy of 0.2% of full scale. And that follows that. Uh, CSA does it a little bit different. And they say your input power is 0.5% of reading, and that's going to include CTs and PTs that may be in part of the measurement. Uh, IEEE and NAVLAP do not include the CT and uh, PT at this point. They do specify an accuracy for CTs and PTs, typically at 0.3% uh, of full scale. And that's the ratio and phase error. So you've got to have pretty good CTs and pretty good instrumentation. Then it also defines the torque and the uh, speed accuracy measurements. And some other things that uh, that are done required in the uh, 112 and uh, NAVLAP uh, testing are some temperature rise and things like that. So it defines the temperature measurements also. So here's a quick reference of where you need to be with the type of instrumentation for testing your motors to these standards. So current sensors, how are we going to measure this current? Um, some of our, you know, power meters, power transducers, and things like that, um, they may go up to 20, 30 amps, maybe 50 amps. We're going to have to step that current down. So we offer quite a few different uh, solutions to the current sensors. Uh, one of them we resell. Uh, we work as a distributor for AEMC, and they make some nice uh, clamp arms. You have to be careful. Remember the accuracy limit. So different models have different accuracies, but they do have a clamp on that will get in that 0.3% accuracy class. Uh, scope probes, they're handy. Uh, Got to use them for scopes. They're typically what we look at in the 1% to 2% area on what I've seen on most scope probes. So those would typically not be suitable for use with your power uh, meter uh, in meeting uh, some of the uh, IEEE test standards or CSA. Uh, we do make a couple of transformers ourselves for a voltage and current. These are a 0.2% accuracy class, so uh, the, this model 2241 would meet a lot of your requirements. Uh, shunts, um, very accurate shunts. Uh, we work with RAM meter and resell those for your DC measurements. Uh, we can get shunts in the 0.1 and 0.33% accuracy class. Uh, Pearson Electronics. Um, well known uh, for uh, current measurements, but typically they're high frequency, good uh, to about 1%. Then we have another system that we've developed uh, with uh, uh, Dan Physic, which is now LEM. It's a complete active type of you know, power measurement, very high accuracy, 0.05% uh, typically. They do have some that are point, even better than that, 0.02. And nice thing about these is they work at high frequencies, so when we get into your uh, drive systems and the distorted waveforms, it's a very good solution because they operate from zero hertz or DC on up into the uh, kilohertz area, which you would have with your drive. So we can help you. We have a lot of good solutions uh, for different things there. So when you're selecting a current transformer, uh, if you're looking at the accuracy, typically the spec is the CT turns ratio accuracy. You got to look at phase shift. We're dealing with power, and uh, you know phase shift can be a function of a power factor. This phase shift. So how much phase shift can you uh, tolerate? You know it's kind of up to your your design and your measurement. Uh, one or two degrees, say the cosine of two degrees is 0.9994. Will that keep you in your accuracy range? Uh, we'll have to look at it and see. Of course, we've got to consider the frequency range, especially when we're dealing with the uh, drives. Uh, if we're doing DC to line frequency, sine waves, just the motor only, we can get by with a DC shunt. Uh, some of the other things to measure DC and AC, uh, we can use a Hall effect type uh, current transformer or the active type like the uh, uh, LEM system I showed you. Uh, the Hall effect, usually we lose accuracy uh, on, on that type of a device. And what we call standard instrument transformers, 
Uh, these can operate about 30 hertz and higher. Uh, there's various types, a lot of them available. Uh, again, we can help you with that selection if you need it. So we got to also think about instrument compatibility. Uh, what kind of an output does that current transformer have? Does it have a millivolt per amp or a straight, uh, you know, a lot of them had like a five amp output. Uh, we've got to think about the impedance load and burden that we're putting on the CT. How far is it away from the instrument? How much wire are we going to have to hook onto that CT? And scope probes, I said caution, um, used on scopes, typically not on power analyzers. You've got to check the specs on these things very carefully. They're handy, they're nice, but uh, may not meet our measurement requirements. Then you got to think, of course, about your uh, physical size, uh, connection type, clamp on, or donut type, and uh, like I was talking here a little bit, the distance from the load to the instrument. A word of caution, if you're using a standard instrument transformer, never open circuit the secondary side of a transformer while it's energized. If you got current going through that CT, do not open the secondary side. Uh, can cause serious damage to the CT, uh, can possibly be harmful to the equipment and the operator. Remember, a CT, a current transformer, is a current source. So going back to Ohm's law, where E equals I times R, okay, if R becomes very large, we open circuit it, the internal voltage inside that CT becomes very high. And this can cause the magnetic saturation of the core, uh, the windings can be damaged, uh, it uh, can destroy the whole CT and cost you a lot of money. So just never open circuit that secondary side of a current transformer while it's energized. Let's look at some of our uh, measurements now on a three-phase AC motor. So we're going to take our motor and maybe apply some type of a load to it. My monitor, monitor this uh, three-phase input to our motor. So we've got a three-phase motor here. We've got an AC input. Typical measurements, we may look at each of the three uh, voltages line to line. And we're pretty well balanced here at 120. We can look at each of the uh, line phase currents. And uh, in this case, it was a small load, 415 milliamps. Look at our total power. And so that's our symbol that we're using here is P sigma A or total on the, on the group A measurements uh, doing the um, two one meter, actually I got three inputs, so this would be the, the 3V3A input. And then uh, lambda for our power factor here, the uh, pretty good load, uh, 0.899. And so as the motor is loaded, this power factor is going to improve. That might be some typical measurements that you're looking at. So on the three phase uh, three wire, we call this a delta connection. If you've heard the word delta, uh, this is a delta connection. But now look what happens to our voltages. Uh, we look at these things. It's not the typical 120 degrees apart that we would think about with our AC line. Our phase currents, those are 120 degrees apart. But the voltages are 60 degrees apart. Well, what happened here? This is about the time you guys are calling us saying something's wrong with the power meter or how do I hook it up, <laughs> okay? So, if we look at our voltages line to line, another example, uh, we had the uh, 74, 75 volts, uh, pretty well balanced currents, uh, and I got my total VA at uh, 32, and I got a VAR measurement. My power measurement is the sum of two of the watt meters. In this case, we're adding uh, the power from uh, channel one and channel two or elements one plus two to give us the total. Okay. And then I can look at the uh, power factor. But I'm looking here, here's my power factor on phase one, phase two, and phase three. But they're not equal, what's the matter? Something's wrong with this measurement. And the power measurements are way off. I had 18 watts on one and only 4.9 on the other and the other is 13. Okay, remember, okay, 
Remember this unbalance, what appears to be an unbalance, okay? So the voltage waveforms are connected line to line, and they're thir uh, the, uh, six degrees apart, and the, these are true phase currents at 120 degrees apart. So if we do a little vector uh, diagram, this is what we call the delta, okay? We're hooked up, if we call uh, A, B, C, all right, we're hooked up as uh, voltages, um, you know, from uh, B to A and uh, C to A and, uh, uh, you know, maybe C to B. Hook them up the way the manufacturer tells you. It's just a sample drawing. Uh, the red in here would be current without any phase shift, okay? But I've drawn in the blue with the current with some phase shift. Okay, but if we look at this right here, you can see the voltages on this delta. Okay, this is where we get the 60 degrees. So there's, uh, if the currents are no phase shift, they come back up to the red line, and then you can see, well, there's gonna be an additional 30 degree phase shift between a current and a voltage. And the power analyzer takes all this into uh, consideration in the DSP when we're making the calculations. So we can change the vectors around, and sometimes we might even see one of these uh, power uh, measurements uh, being negative. It depends on the estimate if it's uh, compensated, uh, you know, for the negative reading or not. But this is, uh, you know, can be very confusing. But this is uh, what we call the delta measurement, the configuration, three-phase, three-wire. So what if you need to measure the, the phase power on my motor and the phase power factor? or my three-phase, three-wire motor. Well, I'm gonna give you a technique to help you do that measurement. If we have a motor, uh, say um, uh, a synchronous motor or something like that, we can create what we call a floating neutral. Instead of measuring these voltages line to line, okay, we can create what might be a neutral we can tie the low side of the voltage together on each of the uh, input channels or each of the input elements, okay? And just let it float. It does not go any place. It's not grounded, it's just floating. This is what we call a floating neutral. And then we put the uh, measurement condition for the uh, power analyzer into a three-phase, four-wire measurement mode. And then we'll measure this just like a three-phase, four-wire system. But you have to be careful with this. It'll work on an induction motor or synchronous motor or similar type of device without a variable speed drive. When we're using a variable speed drive, we have all kinds of distortion and high frequency, and I think we actually get some circulating uh, harmonics uh, on the line. It, it comes out we have inconsistent measurements. So this little Technique will work fine on a sine wave type of a measurement uh, without a drive. So again, use this floating neutral, basically on a sine wave type of a waveform. Now if you do have a PWM drive, you can kind of cheat the system again, as we can turn on what we call the line filter. And then depending on the instrument, that uh, might be someplace around a 500 hertz filter. It's a low pass filter. So we're gonna measure the fundamental only when we turn that filter on. But it will give you a way, it'll filter out any of these high frequency uh, harmonics, uh, circulating harmonics or anything like that, and give you a consistent reading of the phase uh, parameters. So here we got um, you know, a three-phase, uh, three-wire uh, voltage, 60 degrees apart, and my currents are 120 degrees apart. I create a floating neutral. I got what looks like a three-phase, four-wire. My voltages are now 120 degrees apart, and, my, and same way with the current. So that's with our low-pass filter on. But remember, you're measuring the fundamental, not the total. So if we make the measurements here with a three-phase uh, three-wire and a three-phase four-wire floating neutral, and I got there someplace around the 55 uh, you know, volts here, line of neutral, and I got line to line at 95. So just going back here, uh, my 
line to line, line to neutral voltage uh, times square root of three will give the line to line, and that works out just about right. If we look at the power down here; it comes out to basically the same: three phase three wire versus three phase four wire floating neutral. Okay. So our delta measurements again. Our line-to-line -line voltages measured about 119 volts. Line to neutral, uh, we're raising about uh, 69 volts there. I do have some neutral current circulating, and I got balanced uh, currents here. Drive is running kind of slow at 30 hertz. So there's some measurements that you can make. Here's another function that uh, some of our uh, power analyzers offer is a, a, a true delta measurement. This is pretty neat. Um, here's my three phase three wire, uh, looking at all three voltages, about 135 volts line to line. Okay, here's my line currents, okay, at uh, 0.24 amps per phase. This delta measurement function through some, uh, you know, the DSPs internally will now calculate the phase power. Okay, here's your phase power, 6.8 watts. Okay, so if we add all three of these phase powers, I get 20.49. Over here, I measured the total power as 20.49. So this delta measurement comes out the same, but it gives you the ability to look at the phase power on your three-phase system. And this is the equivalent line to neutral voltage up here at the 78 instead of the line to line at 135. And we can also see any of the uh, leakage uh, neutral current. So this could be very handy in looking at the balance of your motor. Let's look at some mechanical power measurements. Okay, so we've got our motor, three phase. We put some inline speed and torque sensors and some type of a, a variable load, and we go through a, a speed and torque meter, and this can be fed into a lot of our different power analyzers so we can measure the mechanical power directly inside the motor. A lot of good manufacturers to work with. Uh, we don't resell these ourselves, but uh, we work with most of these uh, companies. Uh, Honeywell, which used to be Libo, uh, Himmelstein, uh, Magtroll, HBM, and others. If you have another favorite, uh, we typically have worked with most of them. And um, there's various types of sensors for speed and torques, uh, you know, different sizes. And I recommend that you deal with the experts in this field uh, for the selection of, of your speed and torque sensor. And then we can match the electrical output. So here's some things from uh, uh, Himmelstein up in Hoffman Estates, uh, Illinois, Chicago area, uh, with some of their uh, torque meters. And uh, they make a um, mechanical power instrument, so they have their own signal conditioning and everything that'll uh, hook together, you know, with these uh, sensors. Honeywell, big selection of different types of sensors, and again, they have their signal conditioning that's going to work with all these different speed and torque uh, sensors. And Magtroll, another one of them, Buffalo, uh, there's their uh, picture of their dynamometer controller. They make a lot of, uh, if you got the, some of the small motors, need some help, they make uh, some test benches and that uh, you can mount your motor and the uh, sensor and everything uh, with a lot of the test blocks and everything. It helps you, uh, you know, get the whole thing mounted. And then they got the, you know, like this one's an inline torque uh, transducer, speed and torque uh, transducer. And it goes through their sit and conditioning unit and this can provide an output directly to a computer or to other analog instrumentation. So let's look at mechanical power measurement. I call this just system number one, where we have a speed and a torque sensor. Uh, we hook it up to the uh, sensor manufacturer's uh, measuring instruments, like I showed you, and then they can provide an output that could go to a PC with their application software. 
And again, we like to use the sensor manufacturer's measurement system, that signal conditioning system right there. And so this could be, you know, like a mechanical power test system. Uh, this was one we took a picture of from a, a Novatorque uh, using the uh, Magtrol and their test fixture. Uh, they had their little motor back here, the speed and torque sensor. They had the brake up here where they can put the varying load on, on the output of that motor. And then through the signal conditioning of the uh, uh, electronics here, they get, uh, you know, the mechanical power uh, measurements. So the advantage of this, again, uh, it's a matched system to the sensors, provides the proper signal conditioning. This is very important. We can get a readout of torque, uh, speed, and mechanical power. A lot of these will have uh, communications output, uh, such as GPIB, RS-232. Uh, some of them may be going to USB now. And uh, some of them will also give us an analog output for other readout instruments. Uh, some of the manufacturers will have a total application software package. And again, work directly with those manufacturers. Now what I call system two is the same thing. We use the uh, speed and torque sensor. We use the sensor manufacturer signal conditioning. And here uh, with the proper signal conditioning, I can get a speed output signal and a torque output signal. And some of our power analyzers and others uh, will actually have an input for speed and torque. So now with the power analyzer, uh, we got speed and torque input. We can see the mechanical power right inside the power analyzer with the electrical power. This can go to a PC with application software, and everything's tied together. So again, the advantages. Uh, it's a match system uh, to the system with the uh, sensor manufacturer signal conditioning. Uh, provides the proper signal conditioning. We can get a pulse or an analog output signal. And it uh, conditions the uh, speed and torque to provide a power uh, output signal for the power analyzer. And this is a very important in that we can make the mechanical power measurements simultaneously with the electrical power, okay? So there's no time skew. This is especially important when we're doing efficiency calculations. Then we can use either some type of a customer generic application software. Uh, here's a picture of a uh, setup menu uh, for the uh, speed and torque setup. Uh, speed and torque, we can set in our scaling factors and uh, for both speed and torque. We can come down here and look at the um, uh, the pulse input, pulses per revolution. If you're on your speeds uh, on your uh, speed sensor, so it might have a uh, you know a gear. This is showing 60 pulses per revolution, so we can put that scaling in there. And if we're looking at sync speed, we can put the number of poles and the uh, uh, source is the uh, current, so we can get the uh, sync speed also. So it's just a sample of some of the setups that we could do inside the power analyzer. So our speed and torque measurements, and we got our electrical measurements. Here we got a speed measurement of 3,600 RPM and a torque of 5.2 Newton meters. Okay, let's look at the PWM drive now. So we got our motor that we've looked at. Now we're gonna put the inverter drive in here. And the input to this drive could be a DC, could be a single phase or a three phase AC input. Make these inverter drives for any type of an input. Then we get typically a three phase output to the motor for our complete system. So here's a picture of our variable speed drive. It's one we use as a, a, a trainer and get a lot of these signals where we have a motor and a variable speed drive. This is a single phase input and a three phase output. So we can look at our uh, PWM uh, voltage waveform. Uh, this is our pulse width modulated. Uh, it looks like a square wave, but there's uh, pulses in there. And these pulses uh, cause a lot of noise over on the current side. Uh, so there are some high frequency spikes. Uh, not a lot of energy in there, but uh, there, there are the spikes that are there. So what are the issues with uh, PWM drive? Well, we've got high frequency switching on the voltage signal. 
And these waveforms are very distorted. They have a high voltage harmonic content. And the frequency or the speed can range from zero hertz or DC on up to whatever the, the drive frequency. Okay. Now the same way with the current signal. Um, again, we're measuring from zero hertz or DC up to in the uh, you know hundreds of hertz area maybe on that drive. We do have some distortion but it is a much lower level harmonic content. But you did see that we do have some distortion. So in making a uh, accurate power measurement on a PWM drive, it's gonna require uh, you know, the, the power measuring instruments with a wide bandwidth, uh, I said a wide bandwidth uh, power analyzer, but a wide bandwidth power measuring instrument to cover these uh, frequencies from the drive that we have to look at. Here's a harmonic spectrum on a PWM drive. Uh, we, we put this, and you can see the beat frequencies in there. Uh, this was up to um, five, let's see, what was it, uh, five, five, 500 orders, 500 hertz. Okay, five, in excess of 500 orders, approximately 30 kilohertz. So this is that voltage with all these beat frequencies, a lot of harmonics. On the current side, though, you see that rolls off pretty quick. We get a couple spikes out here, not much energy in those. Okay. So the current side, there's not a whole lot there. So how do we make these measurements? <clears throat> well, the inverter voltage uh, is measured typically two ways. We can measure it as a true RMS measurement. It's going to include uh, all the harmonic content. The uh, amplitude of the fundamental, uh, and that's typically what contributes to the motor torque, okay, on the fundamental. And remember, our frequency ranges from uh, zero hertz or DC all the way up. So um, we typically want to do, you know, we're looking at an RMS measurement, or we could look at just the fundamental. Now on the current side, we typically use a, an RMS current measurement because we want to see all the harmonic content. And some of these harmonics, uh, that's what is uh, results in the temperature rise in, in the motor. So how do we measure the amplitude on the fundamental wave? Well, as we talked a little bit earlier, we can put a low pass filter in there. And uh, that'll give us an RMS voltage of the fundamental uh, with the proper filter applied in, in your instrument. So you, you got to have the right filter, you know, for for that uh, frequency range. But when you turn the filter on, it's going to filter the current and the power measurements. So we typically say filtering is usually not desirable. So how are we going to measure that fundamental? Well, here's where that mean measurement came in. Okay, this is a half cycle average or a mean, uh, rectified several different terms, but it's a way of getting the fundamental voltage. And then we scale it to RMS with that 1.11 multiplier. So we can get this RMS voltage uh, of the fundamental without filtering. And this has been used for a long time. It's been very well accepted for many years. Okay, remember, if we know the uh, uh, average, half cycle average, or the mean value, we want to get the RMS, we get this mean multiplied by 1.11. And that's all done inside the instrumentation usually. Now another way, and uh, some of the more advanced instruments that we have now, uh, we can do a harmonic analysis, and we can get the true fundamental voltage. So the harmonic analysis uses the uh, FFT, and so we can get the um, uh, amplitude uh, of that each order, or we look at order number one, and that's the fundamental. And this will give us an accurate RMS voltage uh, of that fundamental. So we can typically make these uh, RMS measurements simultaneously with the other uh, power measurement functions. So here's an example. We had an R, uh, our total RMS 
uh, was reading 219. The mean uh, calculation was done at 194.342. If I turn the filter on, I came out with 194.669, pretty close. And if I use the FFT function, and so what this is is parentheses one, it was done uh, order number one, fundamental, at 193.8. So you'll see all three of these are very close. So if we look at the uh, motor drive efficiency, uh, how do we calculate that? Well, you know, basic uh, uh, efficiency measurement is the output power divided by the input power. And we express that in a percentage. Now we could use two meters to measure this. Uh, one to look at the input power and one to make a measurement on the output power. And write those down and do your calculation. But uh, the problem here is those measurements uh, may not have been made exactly at the same time. There could be some time skew. So what we say is we should use a multi-element power analyzer uh, you know, to measure this input and output. And we can calculate the, the efficiency uh, in a single type of a power measurement power analyzer and eliminate any time skew between our measurements. So here's an example of some uh, math functions that uh, you know we have uh, where we've got the total three-phase power out, and I'm dividing it by a single-phase power in, okay, times 100 to get my percent. So it's the output power divided the input power. Uh, these math functions give you a lot of uh, different calculations to work with. It's easy to set it up inside the instrument. So in addition to uh, drive frequency, we like to look sometimes, obviously, at the uh, drive power loss. OK. And some of our power analyzers and others uh, you know, have a math function where we can uh, you know, put this uh, calculation in there. We can use the uh, uh, what we call user-defined math. And you can write your own equation. Power loss, so what I'm talking about here, very simple, is the input power to the device minus the output power. So here's our PWM uh, voltage and our current with all the uh, switching noise on it. We had total power at 51 watts and power factor of 0.5. Here's our mean uh, voltage, U mean, scaled to RMS at 113. Uh, this is our peak measurement uh, on the uh, voltage. So we've got some high peaks in there. And the RMS current and our dry frequency is running pretty slow at uh, 27, 28 hertz. So we can use this mean value or the harmonic uh, uh, fundamental one to measure your fundamental. So here's our, an example then also of our power loss. Here's our output power over here that was measured at 30.8. And my input power was measured at uh, 54.98. So using the math, uh, this is math function uh, 10. Uh, we can calculate this drive loss. And also, we have a set up here to look at our drive efficiency under these conditions. Another measurement uh, we might want to take is what we call volts per hertz. Your drive should maintain a constant volts per hertz ratio uh, over its operating speed. And so we want to uh, verify that volts per hertz ratio. And you can calculate this based on RMS or fundamental voltage. We're just looking at the ratio. And we can do this in the user-defined math function. And here's an example of the user-defined math where we can do uh, based on the RMS or the fundamental voltage. And so this shows our volts per hertz measurement up here uh, with the math function uh, F6 based on the RMS value or the fundamental voltage. Remember, it's just a, a ratio. And we want to look at that constant ratio over the operating speed of the motor. 
sometimes we may need to look at the DC uh, bus voltage measurement, and uh, we can get inside the drive and try to check uh, that on the capacitor bank. Uh, sometimes that's not available. So we can look at the waveform and put our cursors up uh, on top. If you can see, there's a little white cursor here laying right on top of that. Now, you have to be careful where you place it because we've got spikes in there. Uh, but here I was measuring the top of that at uh, 302 volts. So you want to be careful if you're using that cursor measurement that you don't get on top of one of those little noise spikes. How do we set up the power analyzer? Well, there's a you know a lot, a lot of different things. Um, in setting it up, I've thrown out some uh, you know different model numbers, where we can use just what we call the normal mode, or in the WT3000 series, uh, we use the uh, RMS mode. In the normal mode, we can get all the uh, uh, you know mean value and the RMS values and everything that we need. Uh, the wiring configuration, I say in ours, use the 3V 3A method. Uh, gives us the best accuracy on an unbalanced system. Filters, line filters should be off. We don't want to filter our measurements. Now, there's uh, sometimes there are a frequency filter or a zero cross filter that should be on if we want to track the uh, you know the speed, the actual frequency of the drive. And a frequency filter typically will not filter the measurements. It's a separate filter. And for the voltage measurement, we want to get the fundamental. So some of the products, we can use the mean value. Uh, some of the other newer products, we can use the harmonic analysis. And uh, this is the voltage of whatever input channel we're using and order one for the fundamental. So this might be a typical measurement setup. Uh, we're looking at the total voltage here. Uh, this is the average voltage, actually, the average RMS, 192. I'm looking at my three currents, pretty well balanced. Uh, this is my fundamental voltage. Uh, it's U, parentheses, 1, so we're using the harmonics. We've got the fundamental. Got my uh, total power factor, 0. 0.7, and uh, my total power, uh, 0.09 kilowatts. And the frequency is running pretty low at 35 hertz. So that might be a typical display. Let's look at the total system here. Here's a, a custom motor test stand. It was built by uh, Automation Engineering up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, the motor and all the tests and loads and everything on it and their instrumentation rack. So we're looking at the uh, input power. Remember, this could be DC, single phase, or three phase. Uh, looking at the output of the inverter and then looking at the mechanical power. So in the accurate uh, measurement system for your motor and variable speed drive, we look at input and output power. So we can calculate the drive efficiency and the power losses. And we can look at other drive parameters. And then we can look at the accurate motor power with the measurement of the electrical performance of the motor and then the mechanical power and look at the kilowatts, horsepower, and power factor of the motor. And then the mechanical part of the motor, where we can look at the speed and torque, calculate the mechanical power, and develop some of our speed and torque curves as uh, as those are done in a dynamic um, measurement. <clears throat> so the advantage here is use the power analyzer for all your electrical and mechanical power measurements. All the measurements are done simultaneously. There's no time skew and there's no error. And we'll have accurate efficiency calculations and you can develop a single software solution. Here's a setup uh, showing the uh, calculations. Uh, we showed you some of these a little bit with the drive efficiency, total uh, you know, power system efficiency where we've got the mechanical power and uh, you know the single phase power in, and the motor, um, what we call method A, is the mechanical power divided by the total three phase power. A quick look at IEEE standard 112 uh, for polyphase induction motors. 
This gives you the instructions uh, for how to make those uh, measurements. And it's defined for all the different uh, parameters of um, you know, electrical, mechanical, uh, you know, temperature, resistance. Uh, it's all defined in the standard. It covers uh, several different efficiency measurement methods. Uh, type A is the simplest method, uh, which is mechanical power divided by the electrical input power. And it defines on what size motors you can do uh, this measurement with. Then uh, test method B is a lot more complicated because it gets into what they call this loss segregation due to friction and I squared R losses and things like that. Uh, much more complicated uh, it's for bigger motors, and uh, but it gives you the instructions on how to do it with your IEEE 112. So with uh, all these uh, different methods, which should I use? Um, my recommendation uh, for the electric motor manufacturers, uh, use the method A or method B based on the motor size. So it depends on your application, how much testing equipment you have, method A or method B. You might get different results, uh, especially if we're due to the more advanced uh, method B system where you look at other losses. So you have to be careful when you're comparing efficiencies, how is your test actually done? Some people ask us, well, how do I make a system accuracy calculation? Let's say I got my motor, I got uh, you know a power meter, power transducer, or something, and I got uh, some CTs on it. Uh, what we do is we use square root of some of the squares calculation. So we can take the instrument, and in this case, just uh, one of our power analyzers, uh, we have a, a reading and a range uh, set up here for both the voltage and the current, okay, and then our watt reading and range, and then the current. Uh, CT reading and range. So you have to look at the calculation of, of the uh, instrument. So we got the uh, specs on the instrument for voltage and the current and the uh, power. And so we calculate this according to the manual uh, and this is usually a percent of reading plus a percent of range. That's where we came up with this. And that will give us a reading in watts. Then we have to take this watt and uh, uh, convert it to a percent of reading because we have to get the CT and the power meters uh, in the same reference. So we're going to convert everything to a percent of reading. So the CT is calculated in this example, it was 0.02% uh, of full scale and our uncertainty uh, on that one uh, based on uh, its uh, reading. Okay, so this is calculated percent of reading. Then we take the square root of the sum of the squares of these two, and we come up with our system uh, uncertainty or error as a percent of reading, 0.1115. So that's an example of how you could go about your electrical system uh, accuracy. And if you want to add speed and torque, then those can be added uh, in the same manner. So we've covered a lot of different things here for you today. And uh, as we wrap things up, Hopefully what we've done is um, uh, provide you with a quick three-step process on how to make your motor and variable speed drive system measurements. We've reviewed uh, from our basic power measurements to our uh, mechanical measurements, give you some instrument considerations, current sensors, um, show how we make a uh, you know, three-phase uh, AC motor measurement, on the three-phase, three-wire measurement. And then we look at our mechanical power measurements and the speed and torque sensors and get down to the motor efficiency measurement. And then hopefully we've covered some things for you on the PWM motor measurements um, with our input and output measurements, drive loss uh, and efficiency measurements. And we covered a few other typical measurements, uh, you know, volts per hertz and a few other things. And then we've put it all together and hopefully we'll show you how to do a total system measurement and efficiency. And a quick review of some of the uh, you know testing standards like uh, 112, IEEE 112. So hopefully we've answered your questions uh, today as we've uh, gone along. 
And uh, if you do have other questions, uh, feel free to contact us because we do offer a complete uh, you know, line of solutions with instrumentation, uh, accessories. Uh, we've got uh, field people that can help you from our regional sales managers and their reps, plus our application support engineers here at the factory in Noonan, Georgia. And uh, all of our products, uh, you know, do have, uh, we can provide you a NIST traceable or an ISO 17025 calibration uh, from our technicians here. And most of our power analyzers do have a three-year warranty. So just a few of our uh, measurement solutions. Um, we do have scopes with power analysis. And future webinars, uh, like I say, we're always doing a lot of different webinars for you. And to join the Check On Future webinars, you can go to our website at tmi.yokogana.com and go to the technical library and then look at the webinars on demand. So we do have uh, our, our summer series of uh, power webinars. They are archived under basic power measurement, which was done in, back in May. The harmonic analysis done about a month ago, and then today we did the uh, motor analysis. And so these are archived, and you can go back and review those. And you can also register for uh, future webinars, and we do have some uh, interesting uh, scope webinars coming up uh, a little bit later, so watch for those. Here's a little fun thing to wrap things up. I've mentioned this before. Um, have some fun with this. This may surprise you if you haven't done it. Uh, count the number of electric motors in your house. It could blow your mind. Uh, here's some tips, you know, start in your kitchen with all the appliances. Uh, you got, uh, you know, a motor fan on the um, uh, hood and uh, exhaust hood and how many motors you got in your HVA systems. And uh, uh, you look at your home entertainment systems, you know, with uh, CD drives and uh, stuff like that, tape drives. Uh, what's in your home office with all your computers and printers and stuff like that? What do you got in electric lawn equipment? Okay. Uh, out there in the garage and uh, others. So, you know, have a, have fun with it. Uh, see how many you can come up with, make it a family project and uh, or, a, or a competition uh, there in your family. So have fun with it. So, okay, I enjoyed having you today. And, again, if you do have questions, uh, be sure and uh, contact us. Um, we'll try to answer those, and I'm going to let uh, Christina wrap some things up then. So, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, for such a great presentation. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for our Q&A session, but please be assured that if you submitted questions, they will be answered via email shortly. And remember, you can always reach us, as Bill mentioned, at webinarwednesdays at us.yokogawa.com with any additional questions or comments. With that, I'd like to once again thank you for attending and participating in this online web seminar, and we hope to see you online at future seminars.